Well, thank you, Jim, and thank you, David, and thank all of you for, for coming out. Um, I'm, I'm actually not going to talk about capitals. Uh, I'm going to talk about one capital, which is Washington, D.C. Um, and um, I guess I'll try to give a little bit of an answer to the $64,000 question that Ed uh, asked, because uh, what I want to talk about today is also one case, which is Syria. And what I want to ask is, why has the response to Syria failed? I don't think we have to ask the question of whether or not that's a failed response. That's, that's clearly so. But it's important to understand what lessons we can draw from that failure and therefore what meaning that failure has. So I want to first think a little bit about the kinds of failures that one can have in relationship to this question of atrocities. So to think about the norm that Ed talked about, the responsibility to protect, there are different ways this failure can happen. For example, the atrocities might not reach the threshold that's set out by that norm. For example, there was a big debate when the government of Burma failed to respond to Cyclone Nargis, and the fear was that tens of thousands of people would be killed. Uh, did that reach that threshold? No, no perhaps, perhaps it didn't. There are similar questions maybe when there was talk about responding in, in Zimbabwe in some of the worst moments uh, there under President Mugabe. So that's, that's one kind. Uh, another kind of failure is when a key state blocks action. So for example, in the case of Darfur, uh, China consistently refused to allow any serious robust action to be marshaled by uh, the UN Security Council, really until it was too late, until the, uh, the overwhelming fraction of the killing uh, had taken place. And of course, China had Russia on its side as well. Third cause, it's too complicated. There's not a, a meaningful way to respond. Yes, you recognize that uh, unspeakable atrocities uh, are taking place. And, and yes, there's a, a wish to act, uh, but, but it's impossible to find the way in. There's not a, a, a tool that the international community has. And this, uh, probably the worst example would be the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, where you have a situation so so vast and so chaotic, um, so ungraspable, that even though millions of people have died, uh, even if you had uh, gathered up all the political world will in the world, you probably wouldn't have been able to stop it. And then there's the fourth cause, which is the thing that is our inheritance today from the failure to act in Rwanda, and that's the failure of political will. There is the capacity to act. There is the clear recognition of the need to act. There is no insuperable political bar to act, but there's a failure to act. And so this, after all, is the most fundamental of all the questions. And when people like Samantha Power have written books like A Problem from Hell, that is the great indictment. There could have been action, there wasn't. And so, okay, so let's, let's think about Syria. What, is, what, is, what does Syria mean in regard to these kinds of failures? We can dismiss the first one right away. Obviously, there is no question that a situation where perhaps 170,000 people have died, of whom perhaps about a half, between 40% and 50% are civilians, constitutes uh, uh, atrocities in the meaning of the responsibility to protect. It's not, it, does not, it does not, as Ed pointed out, need to be genocide. These are war crimes of unspeakable dimensions. And of course, the United States and other Western actors uh, invoke the responsibility to protect in acting in Libya to stop a level of violence that, no matter what it was, would have been vastly more modest than what's already happened in, in Syria. So the threshold is there. Is it then that an ally of the regime has obstructed action. Well, one can make that argument. In this case, the key obstructive figure was Russia, not, not China. Though again, Russia had China at its side as China had Russia at its side in the case of Darfur. So throughout a year uh, of, of uh, UN Security Council attempted action, the Russians consistently blocked any attempt to seriously condemn the Syrian regime in a way that might have caused it to reconsider. Now, only if you believe that the Assad government would, in fact, 
have responded in a serious way to such a condemnatory resolution, would you think that's a legitimate cause? And I think I, I would say, as, as Ed said, that was, that was harmful. It was unjustifiable, but I don't think it was causative when we think about this failure because it seemed to me then, and it still seems to be now, that those who are unwilling to act in a way that they would have had to do to even have a chance of having changed the outcome in Syria were quite happy to have the Russians as the source of blame on this. You know, we'd love to do something, but we can't because the Russians are blocking Security Council action even at a time when, after some while, it became clear that the Security Council condemnation, Security Council resolution by itself was not going to change the underlying circumstance. Okay, then we come to the third one. Is it impossible to, to do anything? Now, this is very much the position that President Obama has taken, that he recognizes the need to act, he wishes he could act, but this is a situation where, unlike Libya, it's not possible to act. And let me just read you something he said in the interview uh, which he gave to the New Republic. He said, in a situation like Syria, I have to ask, can we make a difference in that situation? Would a military intervention have an impact? Could it trigger even worse violence or the use of chemical weapons? What offers the best prospect of a stable post-Assad regime? And so Obama was, in effect, answering his own questions, which is action would be as likely to make things worse as it would be to improve things. And while we may think that that was a cynical pretext on his part for inaction, uh, I know from having had these conversations with Susan Rice, now the national security advisor, then the US ambassador to the UN, and a person a significant part of whose career had to do with advancing norms like the responsibility to protect, that she had the same view. I mean, this was a conversation I think I probably had with her in the fall of 2011, when it first became clear that this had gone from being uh, a political protest to uh, a civil war. And her position then was no fly zone, wouldn't work, cause more problems than uh, it, would, it would help. Uh, serious military support to the rebels, we don't know who they are. And so we have to trust to the diplomatic process. So that was very much the uh, administration's view. But it's important to remember that that was part of the administration's view. That it, we know now that in 2012, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and head of the CIA David Petraeus came to Obama and said, we think we can act effectively. We have a plan for effective action, which would chiefly involve a much more serious attempt to uh, bolster the moderate rebel forces. And Obama said no. So Obama chose to listen to those of his advisors who said there is no effective response, as opposed to those who said, yes, there is an effective response. Now, uh, we can't drill into his head and know why he said that, why he came to that conclusion. But we do know from his subsequent actions that he was very eager to find a way to not act. And so all this became painfully clear when the when Assad, intentionally or not, called Obama's bluff. When Obama said, the one thing that is our red line is the use of chemical weapons, and then Assad went from using a small amount of chemical weapons to, as, to use Obama's term, a bunch of chemical weapons. And so then that led to this drama in last September where Obama felt that he was forced to act, plainly did not want to act, and then suddenly at the 11th hour got a reprieve from action when uh, the uh, Russians agreed to um, help get rid of Syria's chemical weapons, which it's worth pointing out, had not even been an issue that had been raised publicly until then, at least not in a significant way. And so Obama was then able to say that he was doing something, even though the something he was doing had only a tangential, if any, relationship, perhaps arguably a negative relationship, to the underlying issue of doing something about atrocities. And so that certainly deeply gave the impression of a man who wished to find a, a reason not to act. And I was very struck by something else he said in that review, which also, the, pardon me, that interview with the, New, with the New Republic that also gave that impression. He said, um, how do I weigh the tens of thousands who have been killed in Syria 
versus the tens of thousands who were currently being killed in the Congo. Now, Obama knew the answer to that question. He had given the answer to that question in the case of Libya, where he had said, you act where you can. You don't act where you can't. There may be just as great a moral argument, but if you can't act, you don't. And he, knew, he would have known perfectly well that the answer to his own question is, the Congo is a case where you couldn't act. The Syria is a case where maybe you can and maybe you can't. And so all of that gives the impression of a man who was, who was eager to seize upon the idea that we're unable to address this for, for tactical reasons, not because we lack the political will. At the same time, I think it's much too easy to say he was a coward. He was afraid of risking his, his own uh, political capital, and so he chose uh, not to act. I think it's a more complicated uh, interaction than that. Um, and I think if we sort of think about these categories I've laid out, there is a, a kind of terrible self-reinforcing process between the we can't do it argument, it's too complicated, and I don't want to do it because I fear the political cost will be too high. And here the example I think of, the precedent I think of, is less Rwanda than, than the Balkans. And by that I mean not Kosovo, but Bosnia in 1993, 1994, 1995. The reason I say that is that Rwanda is, of course, the example, the supreme example of a failure of political will. But it's also true that it happened very, very quickly. And, and once the political will failed, uh, then it was all too possible to say, uh, uh, it's, it, it's, it's too late now. I think also in Rwanda it was clear that you could have done something. Uh, whereas in Bosnia, it was much harder to say. I mean, Clinton has later, President Clinton has later said he could have saved 250,000 people in, in Rwanda. Bosnia was a slow-acting atrocity, like Syria. It happened over a long, long period of time, like Syria. And as in the case of Syria, President Clinton's initial thought was, I want to find a reason to not do this. He wanted to find a reason to not do it because the American people had made it all too clear they did not want to be involved in these kinds of foreign entanglements after the catastrophe in Somalia, after kind of a, a not nearly as great of a mess in Haiti, but that probably didn't help matters either. So Clinton feared doing it and also believed at the same time that it was impossible to do, that any intervention could do nothing to really change the underlying problem, which was the ancient simmering hatreds of that reason. He had read uh, Robert Kaplan's book, uh, Balkan Ghosts. He was persuaded that this was an immemorial event that was happening and there was nothing he could do. And so Clinton chose to believe those who said there is no effective way of acting, both because there was a strong argument that there was no effective way of acting, and because he knew that there would be tremendous costs of acting. The likelihood of failure meant that the political costs of acting were that much greater, because the political costs of acting are when you fail. If you succeed, then at least it redounds to some extent to your credit, as was the case, for example, in, in Libya with Obama, as was ultimately the case in Haiti, where a kind of failed intervention led to a successful intervention. But so the greater the likelihood of failure, the more a president is going to feel, is going to fear the political consequences to himself. That's why I say there's a kind of a terrible interaction between these two different thoughts uh, in the mind uh, of a president. Now, Clinton had an option of a limited bombing campaign, which of course he ultimately took when he when his hand was forced. His the, the equivalent for Clinton of the moment when Assad crossed the red line through chemical weapons was Srebrenica. Forced him to act, he acted and actually succeeded in bringing the atrocities to an end. Now, of course, Obama doesn't have that option anymore. He may have had it once upon a time um, uh, because of the different nature of the two conflicts, because in Syria you have had, had from the beginning a patchwork of peoples and forces such that any bombing action, for example, the kind of bombing you might have used in order to create a no-fly zone, in order to create a humanitarian corridor, in order to create a region where uh, uh, insurgents could be safe, would inevitably cause uh, enormous numbers of deaths to civilians, or let's say significant numbers of deaths to civilians. You also had the danger that he always feared of a wider war. A wider war was not a fear in the Balkans in the same way. It was, and obviously quite justifiably, 
uh, a fear in the case of of, uh, of Syria. Um, yeah, the irony is, of course, that that by not acting, Obama has wound up creating something of the situation that he feared he would create by acting. First of all, of course, the level of of, of death has grown enormously since he made that fateful choice in 2012 uh, to not do something. But second, the the more self interested fears. If we can separate the humanitarian considerations from the the self interested the national interest considerations, those have all come to pass, if not all, then certainly most of them. That is to say, the fear of a, of a regional destabilization. Lebanon is now in very, very grave danger because of the spillover effect of the war in Syria. And of course, we now have a massive jihadist element that, that didn't exist uh, before. Um, and so the, the uh, irony, I suppose, is that there is now a kind of, you might say, a realist, a national interest argument for some kind of forceful intervention in Syria that didn't exist before. Though there was also a national interest argument for a kind of intervention that would target uh, the jihadist forces, the so-called ISIS group, the uh, ones who are yet more crazy than Al Qaeda. Uh, and I, I fear that Obama ultimately will actually choose to target uh, those um, uh, jihadists as opposed to the, the Assad regime. But we actually now see some sign uh, of possible uh, decision, a possible decision to increase significantly the level of support to the rebels. This came out in his conversations or was on the side of his conversations that Obama just had in, in Saudi Arabia this past week. Uh, but so the point I want to make, though, is that while from the point of view of advocates of stronger action, it looks like Obama simply has had a failure of will. The answer, I, I would say, yes, he has. But in this self-reinforcing way where he can tell himself that any action he chose to make would be a mistake. And he, he can seize upon that perfectly legitimate claim. But I, I, we have to consider the fact that the president we're talking about is the person who we would have said was the most likely to act in the face of atrocities. He was a president who was a constitutional lawyer, deeply versed in international law and a deep believer in international law, who had embraced the responsibility to protect, who had created an atrocity prevention mechanism, who had surrounded himself with figures like Samantha Power, Susan Rice, Gail Smith, who were all very important advocates of the responsibility to protect. So that is a very discouraging combination of facts that even in this case, this president found good reason, and I want to emphasize, I think wrong, but good reason to choose not to act in a way that might have had an effect uh, on, on, on the combat. So what should we infer from this? Well, first, I did not talk about capitals. I talked about Washington. Why? Because it seems to me that in, in many of the situations that, for example, Ed described, the United States can be a player on the sideline. There are cases where regional actors can act. There are places where the United States may play a largely uh, either a convening or a logistical role. But when we are talking about these immense dramas where the atrocities are already occurring, where it is state power that is perpetrating those atrocities. It is not easy to imagine a response that is not, in the end, centered around the United States. The US may have led from behind in Libya, but I think it, everybody knows that its, its NATO role was absolutely central. It just did, the US did not want to be seen as playing that central role. And so because the United States both accepts, in theory, this principle, and because it has unrivaled military power, economic power, diplomatic convening power, there will not be a response in cases like this unless the United States is prepared to make that response. And the United States, I think the lessons go on to say, will not be prepared to make that response unless first it has a, well, first it has a leader who is committed to doing so. That's hardly to be taken for granted. Second, unless the situation seems 
pretty highly susceptible of an effective and limited solution, as was the case in Libya, as is not the case in a lot of other places. And perhaps third, and here's a variable which is negative right now, you have an American public which is prepared to accept the possibility that things will go wrong. I think right now we're in a moment where the American public is just deeply uh, uncomfortable with the idea of strong American action of any kind abroad. It's an American public that has, that has, recall, that has um, um, fallen back into what we now call the homeland. And so if there's any source of hopefulness about any of this very dark picture that I've drawn, it's that I don't think that this is a permanent condition of the United States and of the American public. And I, I hope that the time will come when there is a greater willingness to see American force used for moral purposes, and therefore that the price that a president has to reckon on paying will not be as high as the price that Obama obviously feels that he has to pay. So let me stop there. Thanks very much.